The gospel eventually reached Rome, which was the epicentre of the greatest empire in the world at the time. What happened here would have particular significance because what was decided in this city would be carried across Europe and the earth to its furthest outposts. So what did happen here? Christianity dropped into the midst of a city completely under the spell of Babylonian worship and whose emperor was the current high priest of the mysteries. Not an easy beginning. The people of Rome were thoroughly indoctrinated with the habits, superstitions and traditions that had originated with Nimrod and Semiramis. To be honest, it was a cesspit. Therefore, it should come as no surprise to learn that Christians were bitterly persecuted by the Romans, who tolerated everyone except those who believed in Jesus. The claim that particularly infuriated Roman emperors was that Jesus was the way, the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by me, as he said in John 4.16. This was a direct challenge to their position as gods. Christians utterly denied all pagan gods and refused to bow down to any of them, knowing that in doing so, they would be bowing down to demons and by proxy be bowing to Satan himself. This meant that whenever a tragedy occurred in Rome, Christians were made scapegoats, being blamed for bringing the wrath of the gods upon the people because of their unwillingness to sacrifice, appease or pay tribute to them. Christians' unwillingness to bow to emperors as gods was also considered an act of sedition, the consequent brutality of the Roman Empire towards Christians has gone down in infamy. Once captured, Christians were thrown to lions for sport in Colosseums, while the baying crowd watched them being torn limb from limb. They were dipped in oil and then set alight at the side of the roads to become living human torches. Another method of execution was being sewn into animal skins and then led to die at the fangs and claws of wild animals. Some were noted to have had crowns of metal nailed into their heads. The book of Hebrews in the Bible reports that some were placed inside a hollowed out tree and then sawn in half. These things illustrate the viciousness of Satan's hatred and retaliation towards God's people. Never underestimate just how much Satan despises a follower of God or what he would do to us if he was in a position of power. Remember the golden rule, manipulation and deception while in a position of weakness intimidation and violence while in a position of power. The ultimate aim is always dominance. And when Satan eventually has his way on this earth at the end of the age and reaches a position of power, the Bible tells us that there will be a great tribulation that the world has never seen before or will ever see again. It wasn't until Emperor Constantine who signed the Edict of Milan in 312 AD that allowed for the tolerance of Christianity that the persecution really came to an end. Now the world at large traditionally sees this as the best thing that could ever have happened to Christianity, but I'm going to suggest it wasn't. You see, while many believe this was the pivotal moment in Christian history that allowed it to settle and grow and to become the largest religion in the world, the evidence suggests that firstly, Constantine only legalised Christianity for political reasons and that his own supposed conversion wasn't truly sincere. For example, there is evidence to show that Constantine still retained many elements of sun worship even after his supposed conversion and that there have been reports of secret Vatican files that prove he kept his allegiance to the sun god. Coins carrying his image from this period continue to portray him as soli invicto comit, which means colleague of the invincible sun. Then there is the fact that he changed the traditional Sabbath day of God, which was Saturday, to the now generally accepted Sunday or Sun God Day. Constantine's personal life also reflected the theory that he hadn't ever truly converted to Christianity or understood its message. He became a cruel and dissolute monarch whose cruelty extended to members of his own family. He was also clearly corrupted by his fortune. If we judge the tree by its fruits, we would reasonably conclude that he remained untouched by the love of Christ until the end. The truth is that there was such uproar and division in the Roman Empire at the time that its unity was beginning to be threatened. If the unity of Rome was threatened, so was Constantine's grip on power. So politically speaking, it made sense to change tact from Plan B tactics, oppression, violence and persecution regarding the Christians, to Plan A tactics, which is manipulation and flattery. That's effectively what happened here. 
the persecution, if anything, was making the Christians stronger. So from Constantine onwards, the persecution and killing stopped and instead Christian leaders were manipulated and lured with promises of wealth and power. Constantine basically appealed to the vanity and pride of the bishops of the time. He went on a charm offensive and bestowed a number of favours on the church. Instead of martyring bishops, he began to treat them as his political aides and gave them a say in his empire's political affairs. They were raised to a high rank and given a life of great opulence in the imperial city. Very naturally and predictably, signs of worldliness appeared amongst them, like pursuit of luxury and personal ambition. Error and corruption began entering the church and a focus on wealth acquisition crept in. They forgot Jesus' pronouncement that his kingdom was not of this world in John 18.36 and soon became double-minded. One of the main reasons we should suspect Constantine never truly converted was that he failed to relinquish his inherited title of Supreme Pontiff or High Priest that had first been assumed by Julius Caesar. Constantine therefore remained the official earthly head of the mysteries throughout his life. It wasn't until 376 AD that the young Emperor Gratian became the first to refuse the position of Supreme Pontiff, considering it inconsistent with faith in Christ. In addition, he also legally abolished paganism in the Empire at this time, although this abolition didn't extend to the city of Rome itself, where it was still rampant. In fact, Rome at this time was colloquially referred to as the sink of all superstitions. After Gratian refused the office of Supreme Pontiff or High Priest, it became vacant once more, and the links in the chain that had gone back to Nimrod were broken, but only for two years. It was soon reinstated to Damascus, the then Bishop of Rome, who had gained the position after much fighting and bloodshed with rivals. This position of Supreme Pontiff has been held by the Bishop of Rome ever since. The Bishop of Rome is better known today as the Pope and therefore the Catholic Pope is still the head of the Mysteries of Babylon and its pagan offshoots today. If we follow this to its logical conclusion, as shocking as this may sound, the Pope is therefore still the earthly head of Satan's system of worship. Stanley's History on page 40 says, The Popes filled the place of the vacant emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige and their titles from paganism. Pope Damascus recognised the power inherent in his new title. He believed himself to be head over not just the Christian church, but also over the pagans in Rome. It meant complete authority and domination, both the secular and sacred under one system. How is the Roman church to consolidate this rule over the pagans and the Christians under one system? They needed to somehow iron out the differences between the Babylonian system and the Christian system to create a unity between all peoples, and that meant compromise. What the Catholic Church did was consistently compromise the gospel message with pre-existing pagan beliefs and adapted it based on whatever form of Babylonian mysticism a culture held to. Now compromising the truth with different types of lies is like mixing ice cream with different types of dirt. At the end of the day all you're left with is dirt. So while the average historian will explain that from 378 AD onwards, within 50 years, the spread of Christianity had completely vanquished paganism in Rome, that's not what happened. Paganism had not vanished. At the beginning of the 5th century, it had simply been absorbed into Roman Catholicism, which now contained all manner of superstitious rites and ceremonies inherited from Babylon. Pagan doctrines, rites and symbols were incorporated into the church and merely covered with a facade of Christianity. It was this, and not an outpouring of the Spirit, that brought a multitude of pagan worshippers into the Church of Rome. Catholicism basically became paganism with a Christian mask. It was after this time that the words of warning given by the Apostle Paul to Timothy began to be fulfilled. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Celibacy, compulsory fasting, idolatry and baptismal regeneration and many other false ideas quickly became the accepted doctrines of the church. I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of the main differences between Christianity and paganism was that Christianity was monotheistic while paganism was polytheistic. 
Trying to get the pagans to give up their multiple gods proved tricky, and so, in order to merge the two systems, the Roman church began to suggest the idea of patron saints. In effect, what they said was, you don't need to stop praying to all these various gods and goddesses, all you have to do is call them by a new name. Instead of a god of the travellers, we'll appoint a saint of the travellers. Instead of a god of the sea, there is now a saint for seafarers, etc. So where there had previously been a pagan god or goddess assigned to aspects of daily life in the mystery system, the Catholic Church merely replaced these gods with saints who were to be prayed to, revered and looked to for guidance instead. Because many people had carved idols of gods and goddesses in their house, they weren't asked to discard them completely, but just to revere them under a new name and identity. All the many pictures and images that existed because of the mother and child cults of the day, and which originally represented Samiramis and Tamuts, were simply renamed Mother Mary and Christ. The paganism was not removed, it was just given a makeover. Another problem for effecting change was the festivals of the day. People's years were marked by religious holidays much like our own are today. Imagine trying to get everyone in the world to give up Christmas next year. It would be a nearly insurmountable task. People love their holidays. The Catholic Church decided that instead of abandoning the old pagan holidays, they would simply adopt them under a new meaning. The winter solstice festival called Saturnalia, or the Feast of Saturn in Rome, occurred in the week prior to the 25th of December, and the day itself was called Natalis Invictus Solis, which means the birthday of the unconquered sun. Indeed, 25th of December was widely regarded by all Babylonian religions to be the birthday of Nimrod. It's a date that crops up frequently. In Egypt, Isis, who is the equivalent of Ashtoreth, and who was worshipped as the Queen of Heaven, was said to be born in this date also. So what did the Catholics do? Effectively, they said, keep your festival, but let's just adopt it as the birthday of Jesus Christ instead. Similarly, the Spring Equinox Festival for the Goddess of Fertility, associated with regeneration, was adopted as Easter. The name Astarte, or Ishtar, became Easter in Gaelic, and it's from this name that we get the word Easter. Eggs that originally represented fertility were Christianized as a representation of the stone that was rolled away from the front of Jesus' tomb. It was also as a result of merging Babylon with the church that the idea of Lent was introduced. Lent has no biblical basis whatsoever, but was merely an essential part of the Babylonian spring festivals that Catholics adopted under a new meaning. In autumn, there was a harvest festival that honoured the goddess Pomona, and this became Christianized as All Souls Day, with All Saints Day coming on the 1st of November to again honour the saints. It is better known today as Halloween, the night where evil is celebrated most overtly. As a night to honour the Catholic saints, it is effectively a night to honour demons. The practice of bobbing for apples originated with the celebration of Pomona, who was the goddess of fruit and trees. In this we may also see a link to the Tree of Knowledge, can we say that bobbing for apples is a reenactment and celebration of the moment when Adam and Eve ate of that tree? As the Roman Empire spread to Celtic areas, where the mysteries had become Druidism, the date became a night to honour the god Sawain. Now note the similarity between the names Sawain and Satan. What this all adds up to is simply that when it was made legal in Rome, Catholicism did not Christianize the pagan religions, but that the reverse is true. The pagan religions polluted Christianity to produce Catholicism. Catholicism gradually became nothing more than the mystery religion with a Christian facade. So before we end this part, it's probably thrown up a lot of questions. Should we go to church on a Sunday instead of a Saturday? Should we celebrate Christmas and Easter in the light of this knowledge? I know some people have uncovered this information and now don't. Firstly, I would say to do away with the Catholic saints and don't pray to them as they are in fact demons. Also, Halloween should always be completely off the agenda for a Christian. It remains from all possible angles nothing but a celebration of evil, witchcraft, sorcery, darkness, occult activity and demons. Christians should have nothing to do with this holiday as it never has been rooted in anything other than the occult. In fact, it's been said that asking a Christian to celebrate Halloween is like asking a Holocaust survivor to celebrate Hitler's birthday. That's not too far off the mark. With regards to the others, one Bible verse keeps coming to mind. 
And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Should we boycott Christmas as a celebration of Christ? I don't think so. We should just make sure that we celebrate it unto the Lord, that we shouldn't get sidetracked with the secular side that is ultimately not of God's kingdom. When some choose to make Christmas about Santa, we should choose to make Christmas about Christ. When some choose to make Easter about rabbits, we should celebrate it unto the Lord and make it about Christ also. I would, however, encourage that we stop calling it Easter and instead get into the habit of calling it Resurrection Sunday. Remember that in all things there are two competing kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Whenever there is a secular parallel to our Christian holidays, it can be guaranteed that the secular parallel is coming from Satan to take attention away from Jesus. Whatever we undertake and whatever we celebrate, we should do it unto the Lord, shunning secularism in the process, which is ultimately just a part of the kingdom of darkness. You may still think I'm being too harsh in Catholicism after this, so in this next section we'll start to uncover its symbolism in more depth.